RT in early glottic. Yeah, in early glottic lesions or early glottic carcinoma. So T1, T2, N0, MX. Uh, now, why is there a debate for a TLM versus RT? That's because the oncological outcomes, the functional outcomes are almost similar. So what to be given and when to be given has to be decided with the patient and it depends on your expertise as to how you can give the results to the patient. Now, laryngeal cancers are one of the common cancers up to 25% of total head neck load with the median age of presentation being around 6th to 7th decade of life. And the most common cancer prevalence-wise is hypopharynx for the supraglottis and the glottis. Because the larynx is an organ which plays an important role in formation, deglutition, and respiration, these cancers will have marked impact on quality of life. The treatment will have their own effect. Now, how do we decide the treatment modalities? Factors deciding choice of treatment depends on three components. The patient factor, the tumor factor, and the treatment factor. Being a surgeon, I'm going to discuss first the treatment factor, the availability of expertise. Are you good enough to excise with the laser or with a robot, predominantly laser, the, the lesion? Is the lesion amenable for laser excision? And are you good enough to excise with the margins, which are clear up to one to three millimeter, not more than that? What is the physician philosophy? Suppose if you don't have expertise or if the lesion is probably at the anterior commissure, the physician might feel that this tumor, which is going craniocaudal, would be treated very well with radiotherapy. Physician would opt for a radiation, but a surgeon would opt for a, a laser surgeon would opt for a laser resection as well. And what is the cost and feasibility? A laser machine, its cost and feasibility is, plays a most important role. However, as we go along our discussion, we have found that laser is cost effective as against open surgery and against radiotherapy. Coming to patient factors, the occupation of patient. If the patient is a, a speaker, a teacher, a, a, a politician, or someone who has to deal with everyone in day in day life, he has to speak for him, voice matters most. So depending on the anticipated Cordectomy defect, depending upon the extent of disease, the occupation marks its own way. Second is comorbidities. Is the patient having a lot of comorbidities? Is the patient good enough to have a good pulmonary function test? Or is the patient a smoker? A smoker will have high chance of comorbidity, COPD, will also have high chance of secondary lesions or even the distant metastasis. How reliable will the follow-up the patient be? If you see a protocol amongst laser surgeons, then the first follow-up is at six weeks. We do an endoscopy, probably office-based. If required, we take the patient on the in the OR and try, try and get out with the remove the granulation tissue. Is the patient going to come for the follow-up that often? For first year, we do a follow-up every three monthly. For next year, we do every four monthly, and then we make it, uh, say, six monthly, and further by fourth year, we make it yearly. So is the patient going to come for the follow-up? So we pick up the lesions at the earliest. We pick up the recurrence at the earliest. We pick up into apostrophe mark the, the residual tumor. Okay, we'll come on to that. Why residual tumor? We'll talk on that. And, of course, the patient's choice. Whether the patient wants a single-day treatment or whether the patient wants to follow for seven weeks, go ahead with radiation and come back and the previous treatment where the patient had had first a uh, trans laser microsurgery or patient had radiotherapy for that would also determine what the patient wants further the tumor factor the site of the tumor mid cord lesion perfect for laser cordectomy but the tumor going to enter commission going into the subglot is probably going spilling over into the ventricle probably site will matter most the stage of the tumor the t1 t2 t2 might not do well T1B, T2 might not do well as per the literature, but T1A would do well and the volume of the disease. The volume of disease, that is, the, the, is, does the patient have a tumor? How big is the tumor burden? Does the patient have nodal metastasis or the patient does not have? So a lot of factors will decide whether the patient has T2B disease will decide whether 
we could offer a laser surgery or we can go ahead with the radiotherapy. What are the endpoints? So I would divide in three parts. They have, I would divide into two, but three parts. The oncological outcome, the functional outcome, and the cost. The oncological outcome in terms of local control, disease-specific survival, overall survival, the preservation of organ function in terms of voicing, swallowing, respiration preservation, laryngeal preservation, reduced chance of aspiration, and acceptable quality of life. Now, let's talk about oncological outcomes, T1, N0 for early stage glottic cancers. Now, this is a, a fantastic chart, which tells us the functional and the oncological outcomes of the patients and in various studies from T1 to T1 to T2. And they show that there is hardly much difference between the two modalities in terms of local control, disease-specific, disease-free survival, and overall survival. But laryngeal preservation of late with recent systematic reviews have found to be better on a TLM as against the radiotherapy. However, the voice outcomes, again, they are changing more towards TLM. But yes, for today's meta-analysis and systematic that we have favors more of radiotherapy. Then what part of aspect of the functional outcome does the TLM effect will come on to it as we go further? First, systematic review. So I'm going to put the, I'm not going to put the systematic reviews which have happened over 2009, then 2014, 2016, I'm going to give you 2022. So systematic review and meta-analysis of T1 glottic cancers comparing carbon dioxide transoral laser microsurgery with radiotherapy. 16 studies, 14 retrospective, two prospective studies, all level two level three evidence. They have not included the RCT, one, on, one and only one RCT by Altenen. That will come on to it. But TLM, they included, they had analyzed 986 patients and radical RT, 929 patients. And what they found at the forest plot, that the overall survival was almost similar between the both the groups. The diamond is favoring TLM, but just favoring it, not statistically significant. Coming to disease-specific survival, it is in favor of TLM, but still not significant statistically. But coming to laryngeal preservation, there is a mark, there is six times chance that you would preserve larynx if you do a TLM. Mark the odds ratio, 6.31. Six times you will save the larynx if you do, if you go off, go offer a TLM as against radiotherapy. There are, there are reasons to that, but we are just fixating ourselves today on the data that we are getting. Again, coming back to the, the study, same for local control, that was same. So local control is same between TLM and RT, but there is some difference in larynx preservation. There is some difference in a DSS and OS. Why so? Local control is good, then even it should reciprocate onto the other. But no, because of retrospective nature of the studies, selection bias, pro providing the patient post-surgical margins, positive surgical or closed margins, radiotherapy, or giving again a TLM, again, that goes more in favor. So there's a lot of selection bias uh, between the two groups. And that's how local control stays the same, but similar between both the groups, however it impacts the, the other parameters. Now, again, earlier glottic cancer metalysis. Now, as we know, many other metalysis larger is a conundrum. So there is no settled answer whether we offer a TLM or we go for a radical RT for these patients. So starting from 2011, 2006, Fang, Abdul Rahim, Mo, they all, Mo et al, they all found out on metalysis that probably larynx preservation was better, oral survival was better. But then those built on a retrospective studies. So one of these randomized trial, 56 patients by Altonen, that's a Finnish group which compared a TLM 31 patients with radical RT 25 patients, we didn't follow up was 5.7 years. And they found that it is almost similar. All the parameters are almost similar. There is no statistic difference between the both the parameters from oncology point of view. Again, coming to a prognostic comparison of transoralism microscopy for uh, microsurgery for early glottic with or without anterior commissioner involvement a meta-analysis. Now, as is a commonly accepted dictum that the disease of anterior commissure would be difficult to excise with the clear margins because of the involvement, because of the absence of perichondrium, 
presence of multiple uh, uh, fenestra at the PTOL and involve a pre uploading space. This is a myth. Pareti has given a rightful answer that this is not where we fail. We fail at the craniocortal extension. We fail to mark the craniocortal extension. So there are ways how we can get in a piecemeal resection, cutting the tumor into half, seeing for the depth of infiltration and then getting the margins. It is the exposure which is affected and that leads to a compromise in margins. But however, again, the, the expertise of laryngeal resection, laser resection makes a difference. So coming to this study, again, a meta-analysis, 20 studies sought for local recurrence, over a survey seen by 10 studies and LPR, in, that is laryngeal preservation uh, <coughs> studies in uh, was in 13 studies. And what they found is that the, the overall, the local recurrence rate was higher amongst those with those where the enter commissioner was involved as against those studies where enter commissioner was negative. Just accepted, just understood because of the difficult to cover, difficult to resect as per the expertise of the surgeon. Secondly, coming to the overall survival, fire or survival, again, the trend was more in favor of absence of enter commission moment as against the presence. Again, coming to LPR, laryngeal lines preservation rate, again, it was more favor. So there is no, there was no as such a rocket science to understand it, but then this is the result. So for enter commission people, involvement people do favor to provide a radical RT rather than going ahead with, with, with a laser resection. But mind you, if you compare radical RT for a T1A against T1B, the T1B will not do well. T1, T1, B, T1, 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 will not do well. So even the enter commission involvement, the, the comparable rates are lower for radical RT as against T1A. So early glottic lesion T2, N0. Now, so many of the studies included T1, A, T1, B, T2. So it was a mixed cohort. <laughs> this was the only study, the systematic review for T2 glottics, a dedicated T2 glottics from a cell carcinoma. And they found that they included 4,000 odd patients. And they found that the local control was still comparable between RT and TLM, 75% versus 77%. The data showed the similar rates of local control at five years, treated with endolaryngeal versus radiotherapy. Again, higher rates of local failure were seen between T2B as compared to T2A. Similar outcomes were seen in T2A case and T2B, whether treated with radiotherapy or endolaryngeal surgery, although based upon only one surgical cohort. So again, this was somewhere missing. We need a proper data, robust data to decide what would do well for T2. Now, again, an NCDB database to see for surgical margins. Do surgical margins impact the outcomes of patients? So the answer is no. Now let us go for the, how, how on what basis are we quoting this? First, NCB database, 2004-2013, 747 patients. Negative margins were seen 598, median follow was 48 months. Now this is on univariate and multiple analysis. Margins were not found to be statistically uh, significant. However, the comorbidity, the age, the, the tumor stage, and the nodal stage were found to be significant. The surgical margins, and hence the philosophy changed. The philosophy elsewhere is, if you get a positive margin, you are going to go and correct those. Yes, this, this philosophy is also followed for the larynx. There are three philosophies which are going on. The first philosophy is, if you, if you are going to get a positive margin, you will go again, either resect, do a TLM, or send the patient for radiotherapy, one. Second, you will not resect. You will wait for six weeks. Do a uh, do a, a, a laryngoscopy. You try and see for any lesion. Try and search for recurrence. If you don't find, you would still wait for the next follow up. Again, do have a clear follow at three months and again go back. And the third philosophy is you wait for six weeks and at six weeks when the healing has taken place, you again go and reset the margins. Okay, but these three philosophies are followed world over. There is no sacrosanct rule that if you give positive margins, you would go ahead and re-resect. And the reason for this is, when you're taking the margins, no surgeon worth his true salt would give a positive margin. So the idea is why then we observe that that's because, that is because there's charring. There is no photobiomodulation of the margins. You can't do that. So there's going to be a charring. You're going to, you're going to, so the pathologist is going to sample that in such a way that probably you will get a positive margin, but you've already taken the margin, which has been gone in the laser vaporization. So charring of uh, margins, vaporization of the margins 
these all play a very crucial role in the uh, in the uh, in the TLM. Okay, now coming to same study, if you see there is not much difference in the in terms of the survival for uh, at uh, at five years as well in the both the in the in the both the groups. The trend is not found to be significant. The p-value is not significant. There may be favoring, but it's not even favoring here. Similarly, for a five-year unadjusted overall survival for early glottic, it is still found, excluding even the post-op radiation. Some people like to give, people would like to send the patient for radiotherapy, but this study also excluded radiation as one of the edge one radiation is one of the factor, and still they found that it was not significant. So giving positive margin, wrong message, but yes, probably you can still observe and keep on doing multiple endoscopies and try and pick up for residual or recurrent lesions. And if at all you address those either with TLM or with the, or with the radiotherapy. Now, impaction of resection margin, a fantastic study, 153 patients that divided the uh, patient into two groups. Group A was R0 resection margins for more than two millimeters, total 36 patients. And group B was R1, that is a close margin. What is a close margin as per them? Was something which was less than two millimeter, but not the positive margin. So positive margins of close margin less than two millimeter, about 107 patients. And the revision TLM was done at eight weeks, considering that healing would happen. And they found that the that it was not found to be significant for any of the oncological parameters. Now, why does this happen? Why do we tend to compromise the margins? Because we don't want to hamper the voice outcomes yet give a complete clearance to the patient. So there is a tussle between both and somewhere, somewhere uh, uh, the margins go for a hit. But again, as I say, other factors also play important roles. Probably you may observe and keep the patient on a close follow. -up. Now, this is again the same alternate study, sorry. Coming to functional outcomes, voice outcomes. Now, what are the factors affecting the voice outcomes after TLM for early T1, T2. So we have tumor factors, we have healing response factors, we have patient factors, healing factors, time lapse after surgery, less than 12, more than 12 months, entry of web formation, compensatory mechanism to the glottal gap. How good can you give a supraglottic compensation? Mind large, when you have a pseudocord formation in making, you will send the patient to a speech therapist and he would teach a supraglottic voice. Okay, and how the cellular activity acting. So we need to know how functional, how functional, how functional, functional is tumor or surgery factors, depth of extent of resection. So, so more is a DOI, more is going to be the excision. That is going to be, uh, as per the European Lens Society classification, your codectomy would go from type 1 to type 4 then. So vocal ligament, vocalis muscle, extent of muscle resection of vocalis in sedatal plane, resection of anterior commissure, this all factors are going to play. Involvement of type 5, involvement of arytenoid, supraglottic, subglottic structures, or for that matter, type 6, but involvement of anterior commissure. So all this are going to factor in voice outcomes for this patient. Coming to patient data factors, younger patient versus older patient, voice use, voice professional. So a lot of these factors are going to play and a psychological reaction to diagnosis of cancer. So how is voice subjectively analyzed after TLM? We have visual analog score, we have Grabar score. Many meta-analysis have come. Again, when the there are many meta-analysis, that means the conundrum is not solved. You still have a gray zone. You still have to decide whether you want to give a radiotherapy on individual basis or you want to give a uh, offer a TLM for the patient. So voice quality correlates with type of cardiactomy. Most patients will have normal to near normal after up to type three, type four, you'll have near normal voice, normal to near normal voice. But as you go down, your voice will deteriorate permanently. So discordance in assessment finding between the otolaryngologist and speech therapist. So because of the difficulty in interpretation and discordance, you are not able to decide there are no fixed parameters based on which you are able to decide that the outcomes are good because many of them are subjective. Many of them are patient assessed reporting of the outcomes on the scales that you see. Voice handicap scale. So whenever you have T1 aglottic, you're treated, your VHI will be between 11.5 to 29.2. If it's a benign vocal fault, it will come to 26. Or if it is plasma dysphonia, it goes to 22. So higher the score, better the index. Middle is goes to 28, but if you have, if you go down the cardiacomies, you will have a lower voice uh, VHI scores. Per 18, 2003, your VHI 6 by and large, he gave his, that were his findings for type 1, type 2 cardiacomies. VHI 1, uh, VHI, VHI for, uh, for type 3 was 16.5, 16.5, 16.5, 16.5, 16.5, 16.5, 16.5, 16.5, 16.5, 16.5, 16.5, 16.5, 16
VHI for 4 and 5, 15.8. Robert, I'll give VHI worse for effective commissioner was involved. So these are some of the studies, but again, they're difficult to compare because of absence of standardization, a wide range of values that can be considered in normal range, significant intra individual variability and various computer programs are used. That makes it very confusing. So I'm just going to quote a recent study, wise quality outcomes, a prospective study in 2022, which was published. And it was for 12 months post-student period that they started analyzing the, <coughs> the parameters which analyzed were uh, fundamental frequency, maximal phonation time, VHI, GRABA score, noise to harmonic ratio, F0 st uh, fundamental standard deviation. 131 patients, 76 patients in uh, underwent cordectomy 1 to 3, 55 underwent 4 to 6. So at three months for type 1, type 2, so 3, 6, and 12 months, all of these parameters improved. For type 4 and to type 6, breathiness was much higher, MPT was much significantly worsened. But it all improved. However, MPT was the only thing which worsened over at 12 months for type 4 to type 6 cordectomy. I would not like to go ahead and offer a cordectomy for this kind of patient where the voice outcomes and there's not much at stake professionally for this patient. So taking into other factors, probably type 4 type 6 cordectomy requirements, I would like to do away rather than offering them the cordectomy. But then it's an individual policy, individual philosophy, how we want to go ahead with Functional outcomes of early laryngeal cancer, endoscopic laser surgery versus a systematic review. So again, 42 studies were taken into account. Some of the studies, 23 reported voice outcomes only, 11 studies quality of life, and swallowing related outcomes for four studies. And again, this study was almost like a negative study. It did not give any particular substantial results. And it is still, it, it was equipoise between the TLM versus RT. So this equipoise still is maintained ideally still now. So still we cannot decide and we can still offer the patient depending on your expertise and what the patient wants. So a voice quality, a randomized control trial uh, by again given by the Finnish group, 60 patients, 32 underwent TLM, radical RT 28 patients. Voice outcomes were assessed at baseline six and 24 months. Grabas, video learning stroboscopy, self rated voice quality, was taken into account. And again, they found that oh, the patient, this was expert rated voice quality, and they found that the patient with TLM had more breathing voice as compared to RT. Otherwise, all other pa parameters were statistically not found to be significant. Similarly, self-rated self -rated voice quality for horses and impact on everyday life, they didn't find much of a difference. It was not found to be statistically significant. So overall voice quality was found to be similar between both the arms, but TLM were what TLM had more breathing and wider glottal gap initially to begin with, and eventually it got down. So how, so what parameter, on what parameter does a TLM score more as against the radical RT? So this is found in this article, which was again a meta-analysis by Du in 2013, based on 13 studies, 368 patients received RT, TLM 440, Shima Jita, VHI, fundamental frequency. This is something where the the uh, the author has tried to give a more objective scale than a subjective scale, and they found that TLM scored better over the radiotherapy in terms of uh, uh, fundamental frequency. This was the only parameter where they found that it did better as against the radical RT. So coming to this, the diamond for the forest plot here is shifted more towards a radiotherapy side for a patient. Uh, uh, the, the overall effect was uh, shifting more towards it. Coming same, this is this is basically for the uh, the the uh, the frequency, the the fundamental frequency. Uh, sorry, this was basically for the VHI score. Again, the second here, here again for VHI score, the diamond is more in terms uh, more favorable for the for the radiotherapy arm as against the as against the TLM. But again, they are not statistically found to be significant. Coming to fundamental frequency. They were found to be more effective. I'm sorry, we don't have here slide. Is it cost effective? Coming to third category, is it cost effective? Yes. The cost minimization and cost effectiveness study comparing transoral carbon dioxide laser cordectomy, Lydigo Fisher. So they compared three modalities for T1, T2, N0, M0 glottic cancers, 56 patients, 65 of mean age, and they tried to see for cost minimization and cost effectiveness. Cost minimization is actually the direct cost that you incur and the indirect cost that you incur, the exact cost that you incur, and the cost effectiveness is depending on the outcomes divided by the event. So cost effectiveness is a better parameter as against cost minimization. And they compared between three modalities and they found that 
the carbon dioxide laser, the, the cost effectiveness was quite higher. The, the euros that were spent was much lower as against radiotherapy and laryngofacial. Now, what are the factors that did, they, did, they took into the effect? They took into account the hospital stay, about the, they took into account the complications, the requirement of tracheostomy, the, the, uh, the, the requirement of radiotherapy induced side effects. So all these parameters were taken to apply into, into, the, into the account and they found that carbon dioxide laser probably had got the least, it was much more cost effective and least costly option as against the other two options. Some, some, something about salvage scenario. TLM in a salvage scenario. So just one study, the current study, 2020, Rosak, there are many systematic reviews and analysis on that. Oncological outcomes were compared to 35 patients after chemo radiation follow-up 60.8 months. The pooled local, uh, local control rates were 53.9%. Same thing, 271 patients after primary, the pooled rates for uh, local control rates was almost similar. 53.9 versus 53.2. And the disease-specific survival was also almost found to be similar at three years. It was not found to be statistically significant. Now, so what is the take-home message? The oncological outcomes are similar, slightly more in favor of TLM. Functional outcomes are in state of equipoise, though majority studies favor RT. Now, TLM is more cost-effective, no robust data yet available, require more prospective randomized trials, need for uniformity in terms of procedure, voice index selection, and of course, randomized control trial. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank Sneel. you, Dr. Sneel. Yeah. Any for comments? Such, any for such comments? an elaborate presentation. Uh, if there are any questions from the audiences, then please, uh, you know, put them in the chat box. Deepak, uh, sir, I think we have some people on the, on the group today. So I wanted to ask Deepak, sir, anything or you would like to put in some something and add to my presentation, your thoughts. Hi, uh, it was a very good presentation. I really enjoyed it. I, I just wanted to add something about, hello. Yeah, sir, I'm, I'm, I'm in. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add something about the margins in TLM. <laughs> uh, um, I'm sure you meant to put it in, but it's the type of margin which is also important, whether it's the superficial margin or the deep margin. Because that a single superficial margin does not make any difference in the outcomes. And if you look at that NCDB paper that you mentioned, there's another paper where they looked at the whole community in the US and 20% of the, the surgeons had positive margins, but that did not impact the overall survival. But they didn't uh, look at the laryngectomy or the laryngeal preservation rate, but the overall survival didn't change. And the Italian group also mentioned that if it's a deep margin, you re-resect. If it's a single superficial margin, you don't have to go back and resect. And if you have multiple deep margins, you take the patient for adjuvant radiation. So I, I, I still think there's some work to be done uh, on the uh, type of margins and uh, what, you know, the, the outcomes. We all we all aim for a negative margins up to two one one millimeter at least to try and save piece of the voice. But yes, uh, there are a lot of other factors also playing. So deep margins plays an important role because if there is residual cancer there, you're going to fix the cord. So definitely, definitely that that would be the. So it's all uh, it's all customized. It's up to the individual and how the report comes is how you decide. What you want to do for yeah, I, I, I was with Parity for like six weeks on a UICC fellowship and they have that very, uh, and for them, everything is directed by NBI. So uh, for them, getting the superficial margins is better because they have NBI mapping pre-op and uh, th yeah, this is exactly like what you said. It's their philosophy. One superficial margin, they don't do anything. And, uh, but if it's a deep margin, they go back and dissect. And like you rightly said, the more deeper you resect, the uh, worse your voice outcomes are going to be. So it's a lot of technique. It's a lot technique dependent, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for adding in, adding a value to the presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> 
Thank you, Deepak sir, for such valuable pointers. Now we'll move to the case discussion. The case discussion today is on early CA glottis. The presenter is Dr. Malik Arjun, who's from uh, Homi Baba Cancer Hospital and Research Center, Vishakha Patnam. And uh, for the case presentation, we have today with us Dr. Deepak Bala Subramaniam. Sir is a professor uh, in Hednik Surgical Oncology at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, then uh, we, had, we have Dr. Abhishek Vaidya, Sir is Senior Consultant, Hednik Surgical Oncology, National Cancer Institute, Nagpur. Uh, uh, sir has some prior commitments from, you know, from 6.15, so I don't think Sir will be able to join us. Then we have Dr. Akshat Malik. Uh, Dr. Akshat is Senior Consultant, Hednik Surgical Oncology at Max Institute of Cancer Care, New Delhi. Welcome, Dr. Akshat. Thanks, Komal. I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sneha, uh, can I request you to stay back for the case presentation, if that's possible for you? I, uh, I, would, I would, but I need to travel back. <clears throat> All right. So, sir. I am in a medical college. I need to travel back. I will be losing my range. So, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. But uh, if, if possible, in between, I'll try and join you. All right, Thank sir. You. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, over to Dr. Malik Arjun. Dr. Malik Arjun, you can share your screen now. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Abhishek, sir, uh, sir, if you're here with us, uh, sir, requesting you to be a part of this, I thought you might just leave right now. Yeah, I, I'm just here for a few minutes. I'll be missing uh, a lot of uh, Dr. Deepak's and Dr. Akshat's comments, but I'm here for a few minutes and until then, at least I'll go through the history at, at least that much. I'm All sorry right. I had to uh, add some prior uh, yes, sir. Actually, it was planned the other way. The talk was planned earlier, but yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Dr. Malikarjun, please uh, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, today, I would be presenting a case on early laryngeal cancer. I am Dr. Malikarjun from uh, HBCHRC Vizac, doing my fellowship in head and neck oncology. Uh, this is a case of a 52-year-old gentleman. He is a resident of Vizac. Uh, he is a businessman by occupation, ECOG0. He presented with the chief complaint of uh, change in voice for the six months. Uh, he has a history of voice abuse as he is a businessman and uh, he is a lo local vendor. Uh, there is no history of uh, loss of weight, no history of loss of appetite. Uh, coming to the history of present illness, uh, hoarseness, uh, this was insidious in onset, gradually progressive, associated with difficulty in speaking for a longer time. Uh, history of shouting and screaming is present as he is a businessman and he is a local vendor. Uh, there is no history in uh, suggestion of difficulty in breathing, uh, no history of uh, cough or hemoptysis, no history of uh, difficulty in swallowing, uh, no history of uh, any foreign body sensation in the throat, uh, no history of cough on swallowing uh, liquids or solids, no history of any trauma to the neck, and uh, no significant past history. Uh, coming to the personal history, uh, there are no medical comorbidities. Uh, patient is moderately built and nourished. Uh, bowel habits and bowel and bladder habits are regular. Uh, he is a smoker since the age of 35. Uh, he says that he smokes one pack per day, uh, and there is no significant family history. Uh, the pack years comes to around 15 pack years as he is 52 year old. He started at the age of uh, 35, and he consumes alcohol occasionally. Uh, coming to the general physical examination, the patient is conscious, coherent. Dr. Malikarjan, sorry. Yeah, I'll just, just interrupt uh, you there. Sir. Yeah, uh, Dr. Malikarjan, so he smokes, but he does not chew tobacco. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So what head and neck cancers or what cancers are related to smoking rather than chewing tobacco? Uh, mainly uh, upper aerodigestive tracts, uh, some uh, laryngeal cancer are more prone for uh, in, in smokers uh, than uh, the tobacco chewing, which uh, mainly predicts for the oral cavity cancers. So, do you know any theory for this? So, it's uh, the twin pathway twin. theory, right? RV is two axis theory. Absolutely correct. So, which means that smoke tobacco predisposes to certain cancers which are palate, larynx and lung 
lung and chew tobacco predisposes to some other such as oral cavity oropharynx hypopharynx and esophagus right you should know this okay go on please uh, coming to the general physical examination patient is conscious coherent and well oriented to time place person Uh, his pulse rate is 70 beats per minute. BP is 110 by 70. Respiratory rate is pooling. SpO2 98 percent on the room air. No stridor. Systemic examination is within normal limits. On uh, local examination, on inspection, larynx appear normal. Uh, no laryngeal widening. Uh, no visible neck swellings. Uh, no on palpation, inspectory findings are confirmed. No loss of laryngeal capitis. No palpable thyroid mass or no neck nodes. Uh, mouth opening is adequate. Uh, is able to extend and flex the neck well. Uh, oral cavity, malum pati class one. Uh, uh, coming to the flexible laryngoscopy, uh, here we could I could uh, we could see ulcer proliferative growth involving the right through cord. Anteriorly just reaching up to the anterior commissure. Posterior commissure is free. By uh, left cord is normal. Uh, bilateral uh, equally mobile cords. Uh, this is a Uh, in C C C T neck and thorax, so there is an irregularity noted in the right cord. Anterior commissure is okay. Free. Okay, let's let's spend a few minutes on your examination, right? Sure. Yeah, you said there is no neck widening, there is no, uh, there is normal extension. Why did you ask for? Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, why did you elicit uh, these findings? Uh, in case of uh, like. Uh, Uh, advanced uh, laryngeal cancer, the neck extension and flexion will be impaired, sir. Uh, and also in uh, CA hypopharynx, uh, the extension and flexion of the neck would be impaired. There would be widening of the uh, laryngeal framework in case of uh, thyroid malignant, advanced thyroid malignant. Why? Why would it be impaired? I don't understand. In so you are moment... saying that a T three, T four patient and larynx can't extend his neck, is it? Involvement of uh, revertebral muscles and extension into the. Uh, Now, how so many cases have you seen a CA larynx involving pre? I've seen prevertebral fascia, but I don't remember seeing any uh, uh, prevertebral muscle in so many years of practice. But this extension of the neck or neck mobility is a pointer. One of the pointers that you can do a laser procedure. Your Extension yes. would be sufficient for us. so I think that is more apt because it helps you predict what is possible. But it's so rare uh, to see the neck movement restriction in a laryngeal cancer. Anyway, yeah. Yes, sir. For planning uh, transfural laser microsurgery, uh, extension and flexion of neck, uh, and also the. Uh, mouth opening and uh, adequacy of uh, vi for visualization of uh, anterior commissure uh, and for mapping the disease. And what did you mention about the widening of the larynx? Why did you elicit that, uh, sir? Uh, in advanced cases, there would be a, uh, uh, widening of the laryngeal framework with uh, uh, involvement of uh, uh, extension into the thyroid cartilage. Be more specific. Why is there widening of the larynx? What does that signify? I want one word, uh, one term. What happens if cartilage is involved? What happens next? Extension into the um, like uh, paraglottic space and involvement of uh, hypopharynx will lead to the widening of the larynx. You will see widening when disease is coming out of larynx, right? Yes, sir. So Extra just by paraglottic space involvement or periform fossa involvement, you won't really have uh, widening of larynx. That will happen when disease is coming out and your laryngeal framework is expanded because of that reason. All right. Extra laryngeal spread causes the widening. Yep. Yep. Okay. I actually wanted to if. Okay, with others, I wanted to ask other pointers like what all will you look for uh, suitability for laser resection? Like we were already discussing that. So in faces or uh, you know uh, otherwise, what other points will be looking for a patient suitability for laser resection? 
uh, mouth opening sir adequate mouth uh, there shouldn't yeah. be any you mentioned three four things besides that sorry sir you mentioned three four things anything besides that do you know the laringo score uh, laringo yes sir laringo so, score this was given what are by the components no just tell the yes, all, uh, it includes the uh, interincisor distance uh, dentition of the upper jaw and uh, macroglossia macrognathia and uh, prognathism uh, with uh, also includes a bmi and uh, thyromental distance and uh, any previous history of uh, surgery or radiotherapy uh the scores ranges from uh, 0 to 17 sir uh it has uh, they have given into uh, five categories class that's even... fine that's fine that's okay if you know that you know i just wanted to know the in this flexible scope you you missed a few things that uh, are very important you missed a lot of subsites that are very important so what what did you miss in this flexible scope uh the aryepiglottic folds and piriform fossa and uh, uh, yeah i agree that that's fine but what is more relevant for your uh, and uh, tracheal yeah, so sub subglottis and the ventricle ventricle subglottis and ventricle so before you embark on doing any sort of laser procedure for this patient you need to use angle scopes angle if you are a true laser surgeon if you are a true mapper of the tumor uh, this this examination is not complete you need angle scope so that is an intra theater thing i i am not blaming you for that but please look at the ventricle the medial surface subglottis and uh, piriform sinus also and you also have to look if the contralateral cord has any uh, pressure changes any contact ulcers or whether it's got erythema because of this cord rubbing and this looks like a keratotic lesion also uh yeah. it doesn't look like a ulcerative proliferative it looks like a keratotic lesion of sort so meaning that the biopsy might be difficult <clears throat> anyway carry on so uh, like dr deepak asked you about ventricular involvement uh, malikarjun so how, how will that make an impact will it impact your uh, further management yes sir subglottic involvement or ventricular involvement yes sir uh, oh. if uh, if the lesion is only limited to the true cords and uh, only one subset of true cord or if the lesion extends into any other subset the disease will be upstage to the level sir t2 or t3 so the treatment modality and plan of management will change accordingly Uh, here in T1 lesions, uh, we can offer, we can give options of uh, 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 transoral laser microsurgery along with uh, radiotherapy. But in case if it is there any subglottic extension or involving the ventricle and anterior commissure or any other subsets are involved, then uh, the margins with uh, transoral laser microsurgery can be compromised, and the outcome would be. uh challenging with uh, any uh, chance of uh, po margin positivity so the treatment option would be either uh, radiotherapy or uh, uh, other than uh, uh, laser microsurgery so, or it can be followed by uh, uh laring like uh, may involve the partial laryngectomy in case if it is needed right and so, when we are talking about upstaging these tumors uh you would be aware of what barriers are present for this tumor to spread okay. sir, can you uh, and the, yeah. uh, the spread from the uh, uh, true vocal cords towards the anterior commissure and uh, also towards the inner lamina of thyroid cartilage and the, towards the paraglottic space and posteriorly towards the posterior commissure and aryepiglottic folds and uh, uh, superiorly towards the ventricle and inferiorly the subglottis so what is the importance of the floor membrane. of the ventricle so what is the uh, importance of floor of the ventricle it acts as a barrier to prevent uh... no no what is the importance of floor of the ventricle
Okay, carry on. I think Akshat was asking your question. Akshat, go ahead. No, I was asking on similar lines. You are aware of any fibroelastic membranes or uh, other barriers which will be related to ventricle, which will probably, you know, if that is involved, then disease will probably be spread across. Yes, sir. So you, what you mentioned was just the extent. You, you have not really uh, ended up to what, what will the barriers, you know, the fibroelastic membranes are there, which uh, yes, prevent the cancer from spreading. Uh, elasticus is there. Hyoepiglottic ligament and uh, Broich ligament and thyrohyoid membrane and uh, uh, quadrangular membrane and uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Just stepping back a bit, uh, like you are seeing this lesion, how would you take a biopsy? Like you would prefer doing this through a fiber optic or you would do it under GA? What would be your course of action while working up this patient? Uh, I'll be taking a biopsy under GA, sir. Uh, as it is involving the uh, length of the total length of the cord from uh, just escaping the anterior commissure and posterior commissure, but involving the length. So, so let's so... let's just step up, uh, step back once more. Uh, you have seen this patient in OPD. You have done a scopy examination. You are showing some CT picture. So would you prefer having an imaging first or you would like to examine the GA or do a fibroscopy first? How would you prefer? First, before going into the biopsy, sir. Uh, so that I would map the disease path, disease, and then I would uh, decide for a biopsy. All right, all right. And what makes you uh, decide that, okay, or you would want to do all, all these patients under GA? What would be the deciding factor, or are you happy with the fiber optic scopy for majority of them? The like you can take a biopsy with fiber optic scopy also, right? Yes, sir. Uh, office endoscopy procedure. Yeah. So, is there a division, or are there some lesions where you prefer doing DL scopy under GA? Yes, sir. If the lesion is involving the Andrea commissure and which is not uh, visible clearly on the flexible laryngoscopy or to uh, to see the extent of uh, subglottic or uh, paraglottic extension and clearly demarcate whether the lesion is just superficial. So I would. Uh, so I'll, I'll rephrase your answer. Your answer should be if there are anatomical constraints precluding view of the larynx in an office procedure. For example, if the patient has a forward place larynx or epiglottis, which is drooping over the larynx, or the patient has edematous false cords, which prevent view of the true cords. So there are anatomical constraints uh, precluding a office procedure biopsy, then you would take the patient to theater. Likewise, if it is a keratotic lesion and you want frozen control, uh, for your uh, confirmation of the tissue adequacy or confirming confirming the biopsy, then you would go. And third, if you have hidden areas of the larynx, like the anterior subglottic wedge, or if it's in the floor of the ventricle, or if the cord is fixed, but you're not able to see the growth, again, you go. So you've got to formulate your answers in, yes. in a very palatable way. You understand. You always got to put them in, in blocks and then you try to answer. So that's what you should answer in this patient. Ideally, like Akshat said, in most patients who have a proliferative growth, who have a good view uh, on office endoscopy, you can do the biopsy in the office, but whatever precludes that, uh, if patient is uncomfortable, whatever the, it precludes that, then you take to theater. I'm more worried about where you would sample, take a biopsy from. Like you said, the whole cord is covered. So would you, do you have NBI in your institution? Do you do narrowband imaging for these patients? 
Yes, sir. We you have knees, you know knees classification. What is knees classification? Uh, and knee classification is uh, given by uh, narrow band imaging set. Uh, in this, okay. uh, there are uh, uh, in uh, cl class one to six, sir. In class one, the okay. Uh, so you know it. That's fine. So we we so knee is a in vivo sort of way of determining which areas are likely to be malignant, which areas are likely to be dysplastic, and which areas are likely to be normal. So yes. narrow band imaging can also guide you because this is a vericus, not vericus, this is a keratotic lesion in the entire vocal cord. So, uh, okay, so uh, do you know of any studies uh, after knee which has looked at this classification in a bigger way? Like correlation between the NBI versus the uh, histopathology? Do you know of anything? And do you know of any studies where the tumor mapping with NBI better predicted margins than uh, white light resections. No, sir, I, I don't know. Okay, go to the next slide. Uh, see. Sir, if I may ask another question out there, is that okay? So, okay, actually, go ahead. Okay. So, Malikajan said this lesion was not like this. It was a smaller lesion. And uh, just involving, uh, say, the anterior third or even less than that, uh, what what would you do? Like, you will just take a biopsy from there or you would excise it fully at the same time? What, what would be your uh, thought process for that? I would do a, uh, a excision with an uh, uh, 1 mm margin, sir. Uh, in in place of a biopsy, I would go for a direct uh, laser transfer, laser microsurgical, uh, microlaryngoscopic uh, wide excision with uh, margins for. No, in, what type? Type one, type two. What type of cordectomy would you do? Uh, it's like uh, I would go with uh, 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 as uh, type one cordectomies are done only in case of a benign pathology. So in case if this lesion could come out, well, to that's be... not true. You can you can still excise a dysplasia with uh, uh, type one cordectomy. So what is the safest cordectomy? I agree. What is the two... safest? Sir, I would go with the uh -huh. type one cordectomy. Okay, so so the reason for that is they have found that uh, once the excision of the excision for a biopsy renders 30% of patients with no tumor. This is data from Australia. Renders 30% of patients with no tumor. And then you send the patients for RT. You're over-treating 30% of the patients. So uh, yes, if you are uh, sufficiently skilled and you have the expertise, you would rather do an excision biopsy than just a punch or whatever that is. Yeah. Akshat, is that okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. of course. Yeah. Uh, okay. So just go through the CT. Uh, irregularity noted in the right cord, anterior commissure history, no inner cortex erosion, no paraglottic extension, no subglottic extension, left cord appears normal, no lymphoid, no pathology. So no... tell me, how do you assess the anterior commissure on a CT? What do you ask? What type of cuts do you ask? What is the angle to the gantry? What is the slice thickness? And would ask, what uh, reformats in what uh, what plane will you assess the anterior commissure? And how do you assess? Uh, you're saying involvement of the anterior commissure. Is there an enhancement there? Or is there erosion no. there? Is there? So explain no. all that. Yes. Uh, I would ask for a 1 mm slice uh, cuts in 1 mm slice cuts from CT. Contrast CT and uh, at the time of uh, like asked, uh, I would uh, inform the radiologist for uh, 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 clear uh, phonation or ask the patient to take deep breaths while taking uh, uh, CT. Sir. And uh, here I would like to show the image of uh, CT. Uh, no, is, what reformats will you ask them to do? Okay, finish this. Ask for uh, axial cuts. With a one mm slice, sir. 
and uh, that's is that the way you see for anterior commissure in all cases and uh, yeah let's go through the ct let's go through the ct Here is a thyroid cartilage, sir. It's coming, and there is a here in the right cord. It's uh, like mild irregularity noted in the right cord with uh, uh, inner cortex of uh, thyroid lamina appears normal and paraglottis. So, is this how you see for the inner lamina erosion? Uh, Actually, MRI would be a better option for. No, no, no. That, that, that. MRI. We are not coming to the MRI at all. MRI yes. for cartilage erosion. There's a criteria for it because there's a different. That's a different philosophy altogether. In yes. CT, how do you assess cartilage? What what window will you use? What will be your landmark for the anterior commissure? How do you identify the anterior commissure on a one millimeter reformatted CT, and what is the window that you will use? I would be uh, uh, at the point of uh, uh, like uh, at the laryngeal prominence, the point of attachment of the anterior commissure at, at the level of broil segment. I would be seeing the uh, at, 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 at the level of broil segment. I would be seeing the anterior commissure. No, where is it? How, what is the landmark on a CT for the anterior commissure? What do you follow to the anterior commissure? The angulation of the thyroid lamina with... Uh... No, that's not the answer. So go and read how to identify anterior commissure on CT and inner lamina on CT. Yeah. And this is not a one millimeter cut, so you can't really see it in this. Is this one millimeter? I don't think so. And it's not in the bone window also, so it's very difficult to make out subtle oh. cortical deficiencies. Yeah. Okay. So go back to the findings. Uh, findings uh, slide. Right. So no may inner I ask cortex. Him, uh, about few of the normal structures which he's seeing in the larynx. Yes, of course. Uh, on the scan. So, Malikajan, if you can go back to the other side. Yeah. So, can you scroll down and show me where is paraglottic space? Yes. Just pause and drag the slider so that it's under your control. Oops. Otherwise, let it be. It's, it's okay. Let's let's move on. Here it's showing. There it's showing. It's not showing. You are in the wrong uh, level. It was seen just few seconds back. Mm. Yes, sir. Yeah. She's showing the paraglottic speed. So how will it look like? Like, how will you identify that's the paraglottic space? Mm. Just at the. Uh... At the level of the two cords and in in between the uh, medial border from the medial border of the thyroid. Paraglottic space contains fat, and that fat, yes. like you were mentioning previously, you will see that black shadow out there. Yes. yes. And this is continuous with the preglottic space, right? Pre you can scroll gradually in uh, thinner cuts and probably make that out. So uh, if you will go down, this is uh, not at the level where we are expecting it to be. That's it, okay. I think we're wasting time here. That's that's okay. 
let's let's move on like you were describing the findings let's let's go there see sir paragraph okay uh i have proceed uh, i would like to proceed with an mls biopsy after the ct ct sir uh, you don't want to evaluate the chest is it uh with uh, the contrast cct uh, neck and thorax uh, would be done prior to the biopsy you don't need contrast for thorax you can just have a plain ct thorax plain yeah thorax. that's fine so either for a second primary but unlikely to be metastatic but yeah. you always want to look for a second primary because yeah, right. that tumor will take precedence for treatment compared to this small vocal cord lesion yeah would you like to do stroboscopy for this patient uh actually it is involving the uh, entire length of the two vocal cords are actually uh so yes, stroke sir, will have any impact on length or is it related to something else sir so stroboscopy it's the length of the tumor is not really impacting it it is about the depth of the lesion extent of the depth of the lesion to know the clear depth of the lesion and the involvement of uh, any so what uh, are the implications if you are seeing uh, what, what do you see on strobe uh, uh, movement of that oh, movement of that both the cords sir and the wave pattern no man and yeah you see the mucosal wave in strobe mucosal okay. wave pattern so that indicates that the rinky space is and still intact and the, so you know there's the theory right that body cover theory body of, cover theory sir. yeah so it means that there's intact mucosa submucosa and rinky space that's yeah. why yeah okay hmm. i will proceed with an uh, mls biopsy sir uh, the findings are like base of tongue valecula epiglottis uh, bilateral ary epiglottic folds and uh, normal ulcerative proliferative growth involving the right focal cord Uh, anteriorly reaching up to the right commissure, posterior commissure is normal. Left cord is normal. Uh, no subglottic extension. False cords are not involved. Bilateral ventricles and arytenoids are normal. Bilateral piriform fossa, interarytenoid, retroarytenoid, postrecord, and cricopharyngeal introitus is normal. Uh, this is a picture of uh, MLS. The lesion is involving the right cord with the anterior commissure. Uh, Just reaching till the anterior commission. Uh, then uh, on uh, palpation with suction, bilateral arytenoids are mobile. No cricoarytenoid joint fixation. No gross paraglottic space extension. The lesion bleeds on touch. Uh, the lesion lifts off easily with subepithelial infiltration with saline. The biopsy came out as a well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, sir. Why did you do the infiltration? You were planning to resect it, is it, sir? Because normal MLS biopsy, you don't do all these things. You just take a biopsy and come back. I yes, don't sir. understand why the infiltration test was done because that basically destroys a lot of things. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Chest uh, X-ray is clear. Uh, HV uh, is twelve. Uh, the rest are within normal limits. uh i would uh, come to a um, probable diag uh, diagnosis of uh, it, the lesion is involving only the one subset of cord uh, right to cord uh, with no uh, neck why, nodes malikarjun why have you mentioned hemoglobin out here any particular reason or just like that uh like for uh as he is a smoker and uh, there are like chances of any hemoglobinopathy so i would uh, and, uh, also to plan for the planning and management further planning for the uh, basic investigation which we have done to or say it is not having any impact on what you are planning to do on your management yes sir so that's part of your pre anesthesia workup or otherwise you may want to see but like that's not really needed out here if you want to argue for hemoglobin patients who are anemic 
generally respond less to radiation because for radiation you need an oxygenated yeah. environment yeah so yeah, sure. these are some of the correctable causes before radiation so if someone has a hp of 6 or 7 they are not for the tumor for the radiation to work you need to have an oxygenated milieu and if you don't have hemoglobin there's no oxygen but in this case i don't see any major reason anyway go ahead so what will you do for this patient we have at least 15 15 20 minutes i think sir what uh, will you do for this patient what are your treatment options and i would uh, uh, i would suggest the treatment options available for the patient uh, 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 transoral laser microsurgery and uh, radio radiotherapy sir uh, so your treatment is curative intent single modality treatment correct curative intent single modality single modality treatment and what are your options uh transoral laser microsurgery sir and uh, mm. radiation radiation by open partial is not an option is it yes sir as the lesion is only involving uh, one no no i'm not asking you to justify for this case when someone gives you a t1 glottis and asks you what are the options you have to be complete so there's so, either open surgery in the form of partial laryngectomies or there is transoral laser surgery or there is radical radiation and you would make the choice depending upon patient factors tumor factors and mm -hmm. so many other factors okay so uh, argue for radiation in this patient and what sort of radiation would you give to this patient uh i would uh, ask for a uh, in uh, i would ask for a single cord radiation sir how many centers okay tell me what is the advantage of a single cord radiation what is the biggest study done on single cord radiation um, it, uh, okay how do you plan for a single cord radiation can you do it on uh, conformal rt do you need imrt how do you I, plan the ptv what uh, what are the things in the single cord radiation? Don't uh, answer single cord radiation upfront because not many centers follow that. Yeah, they, many, they follow. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, I think it's better to say small field radiation is fine. Yeah, even many it's radiation a, oncologists are not uh, happy willing to give single, single cord, cord radiation. radiation. Yes, radiation. So that should not because, be the first thing you should be mentioning. Only yeah. if someone asks, then you should talk about it. That okay. is a medal exam question. So that's not uh, the basic question. So small field radiation. So tell me, what is the dose you would give? What is the fractionation? Uh, what would you do? Yes, sir. Uh, the fractionation would be, the uh, the dose would be ranging from a two gray. Uh, the fractionation would be hypofractionation with... Uh, Uh, minimum settings for at least uh, two, uh, one month, sir. So the dose why, would be why are you giving hypofractionation and then giving one month here? Yeah? 15 days. No, tell me what is the current altered fractionation regimen recommended for small volume T1 glottic carcinoma, which was derived from the Christie's regimen and after that. And what is the recent meta analysis in the Red Journal also? Is hyper better? Is hypo better? Is shortening the duration time better? Is increasing shortening the number of shortening yeah. the duration with hyperfractionation is better option for uh, li limiting the. You, you, you know what hyper and hypo are, right? Yes, sir. Hyper is more fractionation, but talking yeah, so, the other way around, Malikarjun. Yeah, yeah. When you you increase the dose per fraction and you reduce the number of fractions, okay? Yes, sir. So that I, is what, yeah. Why is that preferred to standard fractionation? Uh, the hypofractionation delivers uh, higher doses with uh, limited, like delivering the total duration, the shortening the overall duration, sir, in hypofractions. So what what of the hours of radiobiology does it help in? You know the six hours of radiobiology, you know? 
so what part hello sir so what part of the radiation thing does hypofractionation improve okay so first you said uh, you always start with standard fractionation then you say recently it is altered fractionation any altered fractionation regimen is good better supposedly but we do hypofractionation so that is also fine and then you said single so with uh, have you read tooley's paper on uh, the difference in uh, outcomes between anterior commissure involvement with and without what is the percentage difference in uh, survival no sir i haven't seen there's a 12% uh, not survival local control there's a 12% it uh, tooley's paper was in 2019 it was a huge series so there's a 12% difference if whether the if the anterior commissure worsen worsening by 12% if the anterior commissure is involved okay so uh, we talked about radiation you talked about fractionation we talked about impact of uh, um, the anterior commissure uh, so in this case uh, would you is there any okay so radiation is quite straightforward there's nothing more to ask about in radiation so surgery if you want to plan this patient for surgery how would you plan uh -huh. I would plan for a transoral laser microsurgery. You with... first have to say you will assess the patient yes, for the fitness patient. for a transoral laser microsurgery. Yes, I would assess. It, the... it starts. You. It all starts with the assessment, correct? Yes. Sir. Patient should fulfill the criteria to be an adequate candidate for transoral laser. Yeah. So that is the patient factors, and then disease factors. Is this tumor amenable for uh, transoral laser microsurgery? Yes, sir. As it is... So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Tell me. Correct. As it is not involving the anterior commissure and... Uh, that we don't know. Unless you do NBI, you don't know. And it is extending up to the anterior commissure. So I'm suspecting that yeah. you will have to take the anterior commissure as a margin anyway. So that assessment without NBI is difficult. Okay, then. So the locate so always answer like this: the location of the tumor. It would be ideal if the location of the tumor was in the mid cord, and in the free margin of the vocal cord. Correct. Those yes. would be ideal lesions away from the anterior commissure, away from the posterior commissure, not extending into the ventricle. These would be ideal cases for a transoral laser microsurgery. So yeah, tell me why this patient is is uh, is a candidate for uh, laser than for uh, radiation. Uh, as the lesion is in involving uh, is limited to the true cord, sir, and uh, there is no extension into the uh, subglottis and paraglottic space with. Uh, uh, the cords are mobile uh, and uh, the, uh... correct you you're you're right in all these aspects you're right then what else you said that you were able to infiltrate and the thing just uh, yes sir the lift of the first post that we never do generally uh, many people don't do it but since you have done it, that shows that it's there's not much of deep infiltration uh, available. And obviously, your exposure was very good during the uh, DL scopy biopsy that you had taken. So what laser would you use? Uh, uh, what settings would you use? Uh, and what what is the procedure of doing a TLM? Uh, I would... I would be using a carbon dioxide laser, sir, in mm -hmm. a super pulse mode, a mm -hmm. repeat super pulse mode with uh, six watt power. Approx six is a lot. Six, six is a lot. Do you start straight away at six, or do you slowly increase it? What do you slowly do? To six. Sir. Yeah, and you don't start with six. Yeah, okay then. And. Uh, 
we, uh, like I, first I would uh, I would uh, suspend with suspend the laryngoscope. Yeah, all that obviously yes, and, you, and, you're talking yeah. about the laser, so you already suspended that. Do you do a ventriculotomy in these patients? For yes, better sir. exposure, better exposure ventriculotomy and uh, okay, extended uh, to get a uh, clear margin. I would uh, uh, I would take the false cord along with the uh, with the one mm margin all around three yeah. dimensional. Would you need to do this in all cases, or where exactly do you need to do this? In suspicious of malignancy and in. Lesion involving. No, no, no. You didn't understand his question. His question was in routine cases. Yeah, correct. In all cases, would you do this, or only in selected cases where selected visualization cases. is visualization is a problem? Yes, sir. Like yes, in this case, it is going over the surface of the cord into the ventricle. No. Ventricle. So how are you going to see the uh, the deep cut? You know, near the lamina cut. If you don't take out the ventricle. And, and Professor Peretti also says that by removing the ventricle, it's easier for follow-up of the patients after the procedure, and it prevents dysphonia plica ventricularis also. So that's what that is Professor Peretti's concept. But like Akshit said, not all cases, only in cases where there is difficult exposure. Okay, th then what would you do? Uh, uh, then I would like. Like uh, first, I would uh, lift off from the uh, posterior to anterior. Uh, the lesion will be uh, after the infiltration. The lesion. No, what will... type of cordectomy you are doing? What again? Don't talk about infiltration. Type, it's... type two cordectomy, subligamental. <clears throat> okay, I don't talk about infiltration again because that's not what many people follow. Okay, so you want to do a posterior to anterior approach and you want to go deep to the vocal ligament. Lig vocal ligament. And then you want to go up to the anterior commissure. Yes. What is the depth of the cut at the anterior commissure? What would you notice to suggest that you have reached the depth of the anterior commissure? You will see carbonization of the cartilage and okay. there'll be bleeding at the anterior commissure. That signifies that you have gone at the depth in the anterior commissure. Yeah? Yes, sir. And then what is the other important thing that you've got to do during a TLM? Protection of the... Oh, that is all in MS level answers, man. I'm talking about MCH level, FNB level answers. The raw area should be... Mm -hmm. okay. Raw area should be like uh, there, there are chances of Sinek formation in case if it the. Uh, it's only one chord. Why, why, why should there be a Sinek if it's only one chord at the level of antrum? And no, no. So anterior commissure alone will not cause Sinek. Only if you are cutting, going to the other chord and cutting the anterior part there again, that will cause Sinek formation. Yes. So even if you are doing that, what options do you have? Like, uh, what what can you do if you are cutting onto the other chord also? How, how will you go about doing that? If there's a lesion quite superficial, which is extending to the other cord, will you like to do it at the same time or would you like to stage it? I would stage it, sir. In same sitting, there, there can be chances of uh, contact of the raw area, which may lead to Sineke. So I would stage it and do in a stepwise manner. Okay. okay, do you know of any tumor dimension uh, limit which predicts uh, poor prognosis? Uh, just like tumor volume in supraglottis, is there a tumor surface area in the glottis which predicts poor prognosis? Uh, no, sir, I don't. So there's, a, there's an otolaryngology head neck surgery paper in 2020 from gong or somebody i can't remember the name uh, 1.8 centimeter squared they measured the length and breadth they found that a tumor which was more than 1.8 centimeter squared had a worse outcome it is just an addition to the tumor volume so 
see basically this case is about how you decide so in this patient what do you think is better do you think you get better control what is your final decision in this patient would you send this patient for rt or would you do a transoral type 2 or type 3 in this patient uh, i would do a transoral type 2 cordectomy sir and your justification for that is uh andre andre commissure involvement is not seen and uh, there was a clear cut uh, for your information anterior commissure lesions do better with tlm than with radiation do you know that yes so if you have, it is technically more difficult to excise but they do better with tlm than with so their laryngeal preservation rates are higher okay so in this patient there is no uh, yeah oncologically you tell me why you would prefer tlm compared to radiation uh, if there is any uh, the the margins and the, we can get the histopathological margins after the tlm and there are in case if there is any recurrence or residual then the resurgery with a tlm is i mean the on follow up we can see the early changes of any recurrence or... again so your answer should be very polished you should say several studies have found no difference in the overall survival between radiation and transoral laser microsurgery but there is a trend towards better laryngeal preservation rates because a recurrence after tlm can be tackled by tlm or by a partial laryngectomy vis-a-vis -vis a radiation patient where in most instances the recurrences cannot be managed by minimally invasive methods and you need radical surgery so in my book if it comes to one argument in the end between radiation and tlm it, it, it is in so many papers so many meta analyses oh my god from 2000 onwards they writing meta analyses no difference in overall survival but as tlm became more popular they found there was a trend to having better laryngeal preservation rates with tlm but this is of course limited to t1 t2 fair badly either way yeah sir okay so uh, this patient post op has hoarseness of voice okay following your uh, your tlm he has hoarseness of voice and when you scoped him you saw that the patient has got a glottic incompetence the pseudo cord hasn't covered his glottis very well so he is still having hoarseness the same pre surgical pre procedure hoarseness he is having the same hoarseness now is there any way to improve on this uh, post tlm did you understand my question yes sir is there any voice rehabilitation surgery that is possible after a tlm for glottic incompetence yes, sir fair question no yes sir hmm so you are reducing the volume of the vocal cord what what would you like to do mm. no do you want to do some things to push the cord do you want to bulk up the cord do you want to teach them concept uh, compensatory exercises uh, there are there are certain set of exercises that you teach to vocal palsy patients do you know the name of those exercises which you Um, yes, to sir. help uh, adduction of the cord the normal cord do you know the do you know the name of the exercise mm. no akshit's question was akshit is asking a very uh, fair question how we have lost volume in that vocal cord uh, what do you do to replenish the volume induction laryngoplasty so have you read anywhere how they have done it for these patients no 
Okay. So, mealization, thyroplasty, people have attempted to fix the, but the problem is if it becomes a type 3, it is very difficult to fill the paraglottic space to push the the vocal cord medially. So, it's kind of difficult. Okay. We already discussed the margin issue. I told you with single superficial margin, uh, you can observe. If it is a positive deep margin, you re-excise. If it's multiple positive deep margins, you send the patient for post-op RT. Yeah. What yeah. is the open partial laryngectomy you'll do for this patient? Vertical partial laryngectomy. There are so many types of VPLs. What do you know the classification of VPL? It's given by somebody. Do you know the classification of VPL? Okay. So go read about it. I think we should finish up now. It's probably... Uh, just, uh, probably... I'll ask one more last question. Yeah, yes, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, go ahead, please. So Malikarjun, like you have done a laser excision, say, for this patient. And uh, after that, what will be your... Uh protocol for having a look inside again like when will you ask the patient for an endoscopy what, what time interval will that be i would ask the patient for a monthly follow up for the first 6 months sir and after that every 2 months for the first uh, first 2 years up till 2 years so see there's a Close normal follow -up oncological follow up which we talk about that is 2 to 3 monthly in the first year that's a different thing but if you have done a laser resection you generally prefer having a look again. All right. Now that is specific to laser resections and you would like to have a look inside say in four to six weeks time. Many people in fact go in again in two weeks time and do uh, some toileting at, over the cord area. All right. Yes, sir. There's, right. There's a, you have to do a second look after the TLM. So when will you do that? It's mandatory. After one month, I would go for a uh, fiber optic laryngoscopy to see for the cord status and uh, the FOL will be repeated after two months. So many people do it FOL based only. They, you can use suction at that time. You can even uh, clear out that area, but people prefer having uh, doing this under GA. So that relook is a very important aspect. Uh, sometimes you can have a fragment of vocal cord uh, or some mucosa hanging out there. There could be some granulation tissue developing in that area. So it's important to keep it under check. Also early recurrences or say your margin was closed and you're just putting the patient a follow-up. So it's important to keep having close look at these patients. Uh, yeah, and like Dr. Deepak was mentioning about uh, you know, uh, mediation and you, you were talking about injection thyroplasty. So some centers also practice opposite called uh, injections. If you're doing a major resection on say one side, on the other side, they would put extra injection out there. Uh, some people prefer uh, doing these procedures at the time of surgery, but if you're dealing with malignancy, you would actually want to, you know, stage these procedures. You would not want to do it right away because you would like uh, more so on the same side. Because you like to observe how the tumor is responding, how the patient is staying, how the local control is. Yes, sir. Right, I think it's 7 o'clock. Uh, Dr. Deepak, anything from your side? Oh, nothing, uh, Akshat. That's fine. Is Komal there to conclude the proceedings? Uh, yes, sir. So before concluding, I would like uh, uh, you and Dr. Akshat to you know, give him some marks out of out of 10, like how did he perform? I would give him a 7. Okay. Dr. Akshat? Yeah, I guess same from my side. All right. Okay, Dr. Malikarjan, so you performed well. You got 70% marks. And uh, with this, I think, sir, we'll conclude the session. Thank you, Dr. Deepak, uh, sir, for taking out the time on a Thursday evening. Same for Dr. Akshat. And thank you to all the participants. And we'll be back after 15 days with another topic. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thank everyone. you.
थैंक यू सर